uh, this conference will now be recorded. Thank you for inviting me today. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to this. Um, so it's going to be relatively informal. I do have a lot of slides to get through, um, but uh, I'm going to stop and ask uh, if anybody has questions as we go, as Solange said. Um, so please feel free. The threshold for asking questions here is very, very low. Um, so please don't be embarrassed or afraid. Um, it's my understanding that maybe uh, not everybody has um, a lot of experience with qualitative synthesis. Um, so we'll start a little bit from the beginning. Um, and I hope it's not too boring. Um, but if you have any questions, just uh, interrupt me, no problem. Uh, so I'm uh, presenting today on behalf of the Grade Circle Methodological Limitations subgroup. Um, and I'd like to declare that I have no commercial or financial interests that would influence this work. So today uh, we're going to start by talking about qualitative research and synthesis generally uh, and fundamentally, and then talk about how qualitative research and synthesis is used in decision making processes. Uh, I'll then go on to discuss uh, with the grade circle approach uh, and specifically the methodological limitations component of grade circle. Uh, and then we'll start on Camelot project. Um, Camelot is an acronym that is just silly, so we won't even talk about what it stands for, but it's a Cochrane tool for methodological um, limitations of qualitative research. Um, so then we'll talk about the criteria that we've identified thus far and the process um, uh, of developing a critical appraisal tool and how we're moving forward. So what is the aim of qualitative research? Uh, most importantly, we want to understand people's underlying reasons, their opinions, their motivations, um, and we want to describe the social world. We also want to explain the social world by developing different hypotheses, theories, or models. So qualitative evidence synthesis um, is a systematic review of primary qualitative studies, uh, similar to the effectiveness review. Um, so similar to an effect, uh, similar to qualitative primary research, qualitative synthesis also aims to explore people's uh, perceptions and experiences of the world around them, including health, illness, health and social care services, or education or criminal justice, really anything. Uh, and when we talk about people, we also mean anybody. It could be a service user, a patient, a healthcare provider, or a decision maker. Uh, it's it's what is defined within the review or the primary research. Uh, as with other effectiveness reviews, uh, qualitative evidence synthesis needs to have clear and transparent review questions, uh, criteria for considering studies, uh, search methods, and data collection and analysis methods, uh, including how much uh, methods for assessing how much confidence we place in the findings, uh, and clear presentation of findings. Um, Somewhat different in a qualitative synthesis is there is a little bit more room for um, an iterative approach. So uh, there might be a little bit more back and forth between the review question um, and the data collection and sampling might be a little bit different, but we won't get into those issues today unless someone has a question. So um, how do they differ? Well, in both reviews of effectiveness and qualitative synthesis, we're going to systematically search for all relevant studies. Unless, as I said before, that we do a sampling um, because there might be an overwhelming amount of data. Uh, we do data extraction and quality assessment of the included studies. Um, however, data extraction would look very different. Uh, we would use uh, perhaps a program to extract um, the data, which would be uh, quotations or text, um, and quality assessment tools are different than those used in uh, effectiveness review, so we wouldn't be using the risk of bias tool, for example. Uh, and then we synthesize the results of the studies, and again, this looks different than in an effectiveness review because we use different methods, such as a framework analysis or a content analysis or a thematic analysis, um, but essentially we're trying to find um, uh, we're looking for trends in the texts or uh, disconfirming cases, if you will. Um, so it's we don't arrive at a single point um, uh, estimated effect. Uh, instead, we present findings a little bit differently. So we could use approaches that are primarily aggregative, um, and that's where the review authors would add up the data from primary studies to answer a review question. Um, 
these are um, uh, what would you say you're not going to do theory here necessarily uh, you can also have approaches that are more configurative um, and here review authors are arranging the data from primary studies to answer their review question so in a qualitative evidence synthesis, we have different degrees of transformation. Um, you could have uh, findings that uh, clearly describe uh, each of the findings from the primary research, as you see on the far left of the screen with the individual stones. Um, uh, or you could try to come up with a quote unquote point estimate or um, something to explain uh, the findings from across multiple studies. Um, our degree of transformation would be influenced by the synthesis method, um, the review team's knowledge of the field, the purpose of the qualitative synthesis. Is it to present the various reasons why uh, population A is for or against intervention A? Um, and the reviewer's approach to synthesis as well as their, their um, background and experience. So what questions can be addressed by qualitative evidence synthesis? Um, so if we think that a policy cycle, there's multiple stages of a policy cycle from diagnosing a problem to assessing policy options, to exploring the implementation strategies for a policy option, to monitoring the effects of a policy option, um, we, can have, we can address different questions at each of these stages. So in the first stage, when we're diagnosing a problem, uh, we could use qualitative evidence synthesis when we have questions concerning people's views or experiences, uh, when we want to understand why a particular problem has arisen or how we want to understand a particular problem conceptually. Uh, at the stage where we're assessing policy options, uh, we could use qualitative synthesis to answer questions regarding values and preferences regarding policy options. Uh, and views regarding these options, um, or we may want to look at insights into how an intervention may work. Uh, at the stage of exploring implementation strategies for a policy option, uh, we can use qualitative synthesis and findings from qualitative synthesis to look at factors that are likely to affect the implementation of a policy option and people's views regarding implementation strategies. Uh, for monitoring the effects of a policy option, um, we could studies could contribute to a potential effectiveness review, for example, um, by highlighting the important outcomes for uh, the population of interest. But when is a qualitative synthesis not likely to be helpful? Well, as with an effectiveness review, if there's no clear review question, it's unlikely that a synthesis will be helpful. If the question isn't concerned with issues of experience, meaning, or interpretation, a qualitative synthesis is inappropriate. Uh, if there's a very context-specific question, which is unlikely that a review of evidence will address it adequately, then a qualitative synthesis is unlikely to be helpful. Um, however, men could engage in primary qualitative research. Um, and perhaps uh, most fundamentally is a qualitative evidence synthesis is not likely to be helpful, helpful if there's no capacity to undertake such a review. And that is in terms of resources or um, experience. So let's look at a couple of examples of how qualitative evidence fits in. So if we have research about sickness and health, where does qualitative research um, and evidence fit in? Well, we could look at how many people have a health condition uh, why some people get a condition while others don't, uh, how we could decide if someone has the condition, or what happens to people who have the condition, uh, or how do people experience this condition, and what can we do to treat or prevent the problem. So when we're looking at people's experience of the condition, qualitative evidence is very useful here. Um, but there can be special circumstances where qualitative evidence could also contribute to other um, questions related to sickness and health. For healthcare guidelines, um, where does qualitative evidence fit in? Well, it doesn't fit into the effectiveness and side effects of the treatment um, or the cost, um, but it does look at the uh, treatment acceptability um, and feasibility of implementation. So I'm going to go th briefly through um, the use of an example of using qualitative evidence in decision making 
uh, in the antenatal guidelines developed by the WHO. Uh, my colleagues were part of this. So in the antenatal care guidelines developed by the WHO, um, there were 39 recommendations. Um, some of you listening may have been involved in this project. Um, the, we're going to focus on um, the recommendation related to group antenatal care versus individual care. So the systematic reviews were commissioned. There was one review looking at the um, effectiveness uh, using a review of trials and another review looking at acceptability and feasibility uh, doing a review of qualitative research or a qualitative evidence synthesis. So the review of effectiveness found that the benefits and harms of the intervention um, for preterm birth, low birth weight, perinatal mortality, women's satisfaction and spontaneous vaginal birth um, and they were promising with moderate, um, well, a range of certainty of the evidence. As you can see, there doesn't seem to be any negative side effects. So moving on to the qualitative synthesis, is the intervention acceptable? So the evidence came only from high income settings, but this evidence showed that most women enjoyed the group format and they used it to build socially supportive relationships. Most women appreciated the additional time, but some women didn't attend because it was additional. Uh, some women had reservations about the lack of privacy during the group sessions, particularly during physical exams. Providers found the group sessions to be enjoyable and a more efficient use of their time. Uh, however, there was no evidence from low or middle income settings. Uh, indirect evidence um, suggested that rural areas of some low and middle income countries where traditional beliefs restrict pregnancy exposure, the group approach may be inappropriate. Uh, and they had moderate confidence in this finding using the circle approach. Uh, when For the systematic review uh, examining uh, the feasibility, um, providers viewed the facilitative component of group antenatal care as a skill that required additional training and provider commitment. And some providers also felt that clinics needed to be better equipped to deliver these group sessions. Uh, for example, clinics would need to have large enough rooms with adequate seating. So all of this information on feasibility and acceptability wasn't um, available or um, clear from the systematic review of effectiveness. But as we can see from the last two slides, these seem like important things when considering whether or not we should implement group versus um, individual antenatal care. So based on these reviews, what did the WHO recommend? Well, they suggested considering the option only in specific circumstances. So group antenatal care should be offered as an alternative to standard individual antenatal care for pregnant women, depending on a woman's preference and provided that the infrastructure and resources for delivery of group care are available. Specifically, the WHO outlined the following implementation considerations. Group antenatal care may take longer than individual antenatal care, and this could pose practical problems. Women should be offered a variety of time slots and should consider making individual care available as well. Women's need for privacy should be considered. Healthcare providers and their supervisor need to receive appropriate initial and refresher training to facilitate group communication. Pre-service training institutions and professional bodies should be involved and informed of the training curriculum and the supervision guidelines should be updated. And healthcare providers need to have appropriate facilities to deal with the group sessions. There is many more, uh, but this is just uh, an excerpt from the implementation considerations. As we can see, again, these came from the acceptability and feasibility research. So as I mentioned a couple of slides ago, uh, we had uh, moderate confidence in the findings uh, here. Uh, this was assessed using the grade circle approach. So the grade circle approach, um, I wonder if it's a bit hard to do a hands up, but um, is anyone not familiar with the grade circle approach? And would you like to just uh, quickly write in the chat? I will go over it briefly now, but it's just um, nice to be able to adjust my explanation. 
So if you haven't heard of Great Circular or you're completely unfamiliar, please just write in the chat. Okay. Okay, so uh, a few people. Great. So Great Circle um, is very similar to the great approach used in a systematic review of effectiveness. However, it is um, reflects the principles of qualitative research. And with the great circle approach, we're assessing confidence and evidence from reviews of qualitative research. Uh, as with the great approach, uh, what do we mean by confidence in the evidence? So in a qualitative evidence synthesis with great circle, we mean the extent to which a review finding is a reasonable representation of the phenomenon of interest. So in other words, the phenomenon of interest is unlikely to be substantially different from the research finding. Grade circle is applied to individual synthesis findings, just the same as it is with grade for effectiveness. In the context of a qualitative evidence synthesis, a review finding is an analytic output that describes a phenomenon or an aspect of a phenomenon. So findings from qualitative evidence syntheses are typically presented as themes or categories or theories, as we saw in the earlier example, uh, and they can be more descriptive or more interpretive. Thus far, we have more experience applying grade circle to the descriptive findings, which tend to be um, more often used within policy and decision making contexts. So this is what the grade circle approach looks like. Uh, the great circle approach and uh, assessment of confidence is based on assessment of four components, the methodological limitations component, the coherence of home component, adequacy, and relevance. We are still considering uh, the degree to which dissemination bias, or in terms of effectiveness reviews, publication bias, uh, has an impact on assessing confidence of a review finding. And that work is underway. And I apologize, but there seems to be some timing issues with my uh, slideshow. Um, so there are four components. And in another presentation, uh, we could spend more time going over all four. And if there's questions at the end, we can go back to discuss all four components. But for the purpose of the webinar today, I'm going to focus on the methodological limitations component. Uh, and that's because it most clearly relates to the uh, discussion of Camelot and critical appraisal criteria. So the methodological limitations in the context of grade circle is the extent to which there are problems in the design or the conduct of the primary studies that support a review finding. So we would be less confident that a review finding reflects a phenomenon of interest if the primary studies underlying the review finding are shown to have problems in the way they were designed or conducted. So in order to assess methodological limitations, we use a critical appraisal tool for qualitative studies. Uh, and typically these tools include appraisals of how participants and settings are selected, how data is collected and analyzed, uh, and researcher reflexivity. However, much like uh, effectiveness reviews and um, risk of bias assessment 30 years ago, there's no current widespread agreement about the best tool, uh, hence the Camelot project, which I will discuss in a few minutes. So when we select a tool, uh, we need to consider the following. Uh, is the review team familiar with the tool and do we know how to apply it? Uh, this is really important so that we cover the wide range of potential um, concerns regarding design and conduct. Uh, does a tool include elements that overlap with any of the other components of Great Circle? For example, relevance, so um, the degree to which the primary uh, studies and underlying data um, are relevant for the review question. Um, or adequacy is probably one area that often overlaps. So the data um, the amount and richness of the data uh, supporting a review finding. Uh, if it does, we need, may need to adapt or choose another tool. 
And does the tool focus on the appropriateness of the methods used rather than whether the methods were reported? So once again, for those of you more familiar with effectiveness review, we know that that's also a problem um, is a reporting tool versus a critical appraisal tool. And there are still a lot of critical appraisal tools for qualitative research that have a lot of questions related to reporting rather than to um, the actual conduct and design of a study. So when applying a critical appraisal tool to each of the included studies, we need to remember that we will be using our assessment in a grade assessment, a grade circle assessment of methodological limitations. And therefore, it's really important that we say more than just yes, no, or unclear. So within the methodological limitations component, uh, we would want to have a pretty clear description of any potential weaknesses or flaws in the study design. Uh, for example, we could say the authors have not described how they selected the participants they included in the study. So this is really important for later making a methodological limitations assessment um, so that we have all of the information available in one spot instead of having to go back and forth to the studies. Uh, again, uh, the methodological limitations component, as with all of the components and grade circle, is applied to individual review findings. This means that the methodological limitations for one review uh, may be assessed as differently from methodological limitations or the overall confidence for another review finding. Um, just to give an example, um, if you are talking, if a group um, focus group is used in a study um, and a variety of topics are discussed, um, but one of the review findings that comes out is related to uh, sexual health of teenage girls. Uh, the review team may dis decide to say that there is a problem in this research design because a group setting is inappropriate for discussing potentially intimate or taboo topics. Um, however, a review finding related to uh, how much cake somebody eats, for example, that may come out of the same study, um, this would be less of a, a problem because this finding is probably less intimate or taboo. That's to take a very banal uh, example. So when we assess methodological limitations, um, when we identify a limitation, we would consider if the limitation is likely to have a serious impact on the review finding. So as I said, some limitations may be more serious than others. Um, as I said, the use of some methods of data collection may be particularly inappropriate for some review findings, uh, but not for other review findings. And if there are some contributing studies for which we have serious concern, what is the relative contribution of these studies to the review finding? So if these studies are key studies, um, it might be a more concern than if the studies only uh, contributed in small ways to the research or to the review finding, sorry. Um, so if you have maybe 10 included studies uh, that contribute data to review finding and one of them provides the most data and has the most serious concerns, you might grade that differently than if that one um, was really well done and the other nine were more poor. So when we make a judgment about the seriousness of our concerns regarding methodological limitations and we justify the judgment, um, we need to categorize these as no or very minor concerns regarding methodological limitations, minor concerns, moderate concerns, or serious concerns. And then we always have to provide a justification for our assessment. So for examples, uh, we have moderate concerns that the studies contributing to the finding did not appear to use appropriate sampling or analysis methods, for example. Uh, so I'm just going to pause uh, here and ask if anybody has any questions that they don't understand kind of the gist of, um, of the great circle approach and methodological limitations. You can type your question in the chat box. So 
So I have a question here from Lloyd Leach. Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, when considering the limitations, are they all of equal strength or uh, weight? Uh, this really depends on the finding. Um, so there's no facet, uh, um, there's no kind of um, one size fits all here. Um, uh, limitation, it depends on the finding. So for example, if you had a limitation and uh, it was related to the role of the researcher. So um, for example, the researcher has a relationship to the topic or the participants that perhaps is uh, affects the findings. Um, that might be considered for important uh, for one review finding, but not important for another review finding. Let's say that that same study has some issues related to the analysis methods. Perhaps they chose inappropriate analysis methods. The role of the researcher and the analysis methods may be equally uh, critical or flawed uh, and have the same impact on one review finding, but not for another review finding. Um, and it's not really a one to one kind of assessment. Um, so when you're making the overall assessment of methodological limitations, you'll consider, let's say, 10 different criteria, um, just going with the most popular, uh, widely used tool at the moment. Um, for sure, if a study has flaws related to all 10 of those uh, issues, then that's a problem. But if you have a finding and uh, the data contributing to it has um, a variety of issues, you wouldn't grade it down for each issue. It's not one issue, one grade down, for example. Does that help at all, Lloyd? Any other questions? There is no question that is too basic here, by the way. Um, for the interest of time, I've kind of skimmed over a lot of things. So if there's something that is really bothering you, please, please feel free to just ask. It's, I'm happy to answer anything. Okay, I don't see any more comments or questions coming in unless somebody is furiously typing away. Um, so I will continue and if something comes up, please just write in the chat box and Solange will let me know. So this was a very brief introduction to the methodological limitations component of the great circle approach for qualitative evidence synthesis. So we're kind of getting right down into the nitty gritty here. And we're going to take it one step further, uh, and we're going to talk about a project that myself and my colleagues have been working on for a couple of years um, about uh, which criteria are actually important when we're considering the methodological limitations and critical appraisal of qualitative research. Uh, as I said, uh, there are a variety of critical appraisal tools available, and which ones should we use? This is probably the most common question that I've gotten over the last five or 10 years. So we embarked on a project called Camelot. Um, and yeah, I think it stands for Cochrane Tool for Methodological Limitations uh, in a very uh, convoluted way. So in this project, we conducted a systematic mapping and framework analysis. Uh, and the aim was to systematically map existing critical appraisal tools for primary qualitative studies and identify any common criteria across these tools. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, when I talked about qualitative synthesis, this was a type of synthesis, qualitative synthesis, um, and probably different than most reviews of effectiveness, for those of you who are more familiar with effectiveness reviews, was the data extraction and, um, and um, synthesis methods. So for this particular review, uh, when we extracted data, we were extracting data related to the publication of the checklists and tools and their characteristics. So, for example, um, did they ask yes, no questions? Was there a scoring system? Um, what were they based on, uh, based on research or based on uh, consensus among uh, developers? 
Um, and we also extracted, extracted data, which was the criteria from each checklist. So uh, each criterion from each checklist was coded as one piece of data. And any subsequent sub-questions or, um, or guidance for each criterion. And for the synthesis, we did a framework analysis. Um, so in a framework analysis, if you can picture a closet, essentially, um, you have a very big closet and you have a huge pile of clothes on the floor. In a framework analysis, you're putting the clothes away in the different parts of the closet. Uh, you're hanging up the shirts, you're folding the pants and putting them in drawers, and you're sorting out and organizing uh, your clothes or your data. And sometimes you might have to add a shelf or a whole uh, hanging rod um, because what you have doesn't exactly fit within the closet that you um, already have. So for the synthesis, we coded the criteria, um, a criteria related to uh, that says um, was the aim of the research um, adequately described would be coded along the lines of aims of research or statement of um, of aims. Uh, we then sorted the codes. As I said, we put it into the different shelves and hanging areas and um, drawers. And then we tallied or we used the frequency of the code to see how many times a code or criteria uh, was used across the various uh, included checklist or identified checklists. So this ended up being quite a big enterprise. Uh, we identified um, more than 100 checklists, so 102 critical appraisal tools that were reported in 100 articles. Uh, the thing about this was that I think more than half of these checklists had been developed and published since 2010. Many of these checklists uh, were just adaptations or slight adjustments of previously published checklists. Um, there were very few, if any, checklists that uh, gave an empirical basis for the choice of uh, the criteria included in the checklist. Uh, a lot of them used consensus building among project members, um, but most were just built and based on previous checklists. Most of them were also from the health field and very few from the social uh, science field. If anybody is interested in more details relating to this, um, please let me know, but it's available in the published article, which I will quote in a moment. So in this specific um, review, we used uh, the framework was based on the CASP checklist for qualitative studies. Most of you are probably familiar with this, uh, the CASP checklist for other types of studies. Um, but the CASP checklist for qualitative studies is relatively widely used within qualitative research. Um, and this is likely because it's relatively easy to use. It has a lot of guidance. Um, uh, so the questions in CASP guidance are, or the CASP checklist are, was there a clear statement of the aims of the research? Is a qualitative method appropriate? And was the research design appropriate to address the aims of the research? Was the recruitment strategy, uh, participant selection, appropriate to the aims of the research? And was the data collected in a way that addressed the research issue? Has the relationship between researcher and participants been adequately considered? Uh, this also goes by the name of reflexivity sometimes. Have ethical issues been taken into consideration? Was the data analysis sufficiently rigorous? Is there a clear statement of findings? And how valuable is the research? So this was our framework, meaning that we tried to code most of the criterion from the identified checklist into one of these criterion from, the from this checklist you're looking at right now. Uh, obviously, this didn't cover all of the criteria that we identified in uh, the checklist that we were going through. Uh, so we added uh, some, some more framework concepts, if you will. So, the next two slides are just a brief presentation of the results of the content analysis. We identified 22 criterion across the 102 critical appraisal tools. Um, none of the criterion was identified in all tools, and none of the tools included all of the criteria. Uh, so you can see that a great majority of the criteria, uh, critical appraisal tools talked about clear statement of findings. So did the authors actually state what the findings were from the primary study? 
Um, and lots talked about data analysis and data collection. Um, there was a lot related to reporting criteria um, here uh, near the bottom. Uh, for example, the demographic features of the studies, who were the authors, uh, where was the study published, uh, uh, what was the year of publication, for example. Um, and there was some discussion of theoretical perspectives. On the next slide, um, these are the less common criteria that came up. Uh, and you can see all the way at the bottom, which is perhaps surprising given the focus on um, citizen science and patient engagement and research, only one critical appraisal tool asked if end users were involved in the development of the research study. And I found this particularly interesting, I have to say, because um, this kind of reflects perhaps why we've moved into more participant focus in research, but we can discuss that later if it's interesting. Um, there was even some criteria related to whether the authors were credible. So I found that was an interesting criteria as well. So the question after finding all of these criteria is what do we do with this information then? Um, here we have just talked about uh, there's over 100 critical appraisal tools and they're not really based on any empirical evidence for whether these uh, criterion actually influence our trustworthiness or belief in the in the representation of a phenomenon of interest. Uh, so what do we do? Um, we need to consider, do we need a new tool? Is that hypocritical? Uh, we've just said there are too many. Um, if we do need a new tool, is one tool sufficient for the wide variety of qualitative research we encounter in a qualitative synthesis? Um, how should we make a critical appraisal? Should we do yes, no questions, one, two, three, and give it a score? Um, and most importantly, which of these criteria are important and how do we know that? Um, so, so we embarked on a working group. Um, I recruited some of my colleagues in the grade circle group and we found some other interested parties, including your colleague, Sarah Cooper. Um, and uh, for the last couple of years, we've had what I think is a really efficient way to address a very concrete problem. Uh, we got together two or three years ago, and we decided that we would have a true working group. We would have meetings where we had uh, one goal for each meeting. People would have homework between meetings. One person would be responsible for uh, researching one of the criteria we had identified. And by researching, I mean finding out if there was any empirical, theoretical, or um, uh, uh, experiential evidence for the existence of this particular criteria, uh, present it to the group, have a discussion during the meeting, and decide whether this was a criteria that we would want to include in a critical appraisal tool, and what the language might look around that, and if we would talk about um, concerns versus um, uh, identifying concerns, giving a score, having a snow, all of those questions. So, so far, uh, two years later, we are almost through all of the critical appraisal components or criteria that we originally identified. Each meeting has had one person bring forward uh, the evidence. We've had a discussion and then we've posted it on a PBWorks site, which is open for anybody who's interested to either uh, read, look through or add information because we really want this to be an open group where um, we don't believe that we know everything. We don't even believe it's possible for us to find out everything. Uh, so we're looking for people to contribute as much as they can. So the criteria that we settled on from those 22 that we found were related to uh, uh, methodological limitations and not necessarily to reporting are listed here. Um, I'll read them and you can follow me on the screen. Is there a clear statement of findings? Was the data analysis sufficiently rigorous? Was the data collection reported and was it collected appropriately? Uh, did the researcher spend sufficient time in the research setting? Were the methods for participation selection appropriate? Has the research team considered their role in the research process? Did the researchers challenge the findings, uh, for example, disconfirmatory cases? Was there an aim of statement of research? Was the research design described and was it appropriate? Are there any reasons for ethical concerns that could have influenced uh, the study. If the authors applied a theoretical perspective, is it appropriate and did they apply it appropriately? Did the authors conduct a review of the literature? Is there an audit trail? Can we see how they went from, uh, from data to interpretation? 
who were the stakeholders and were they properly involved and were end users involved in the development of the research study. So this is not uh, the final uh, uh, Camelot tool by any means, but this was the starting point we used for investigating each individual of these questions. So essentially we've had 15 meetings or 13, and we're not finished quite, um, to look at one of these questions at a time and find out if there's any evidence for the fact that data analysis, the rigorous um, analysis of data contributes to our trustworthiness of qualitative data and qualitative review findings. As I said, all of this is published um, on the camelotplot.pbworks if you're interested to go and look. I'm going to spend about two or three minutes going through a few of the ones that we have a little bit more research on. Uh, the first is, is there a clear statement of findings? So in grade circle, we define a finding as an analytical output that describes a phenomenon or an aspect of a phenomenon. And this question is really related to the idea that has the, has the primary study authors actually uh, do they have a finding section? And I know from an effectiveness review point of view, this is a ridiculous question, um, but within the field of qualitative research, it wouldn't, unfortunately, it's not unusual that it's difficult to find the findings of the, of the primary study. Uh, we also have a question related to prolonged engagement. So this means uh, spending extended time with respondents or participants in their native culture and everyday world, the immersion of the researcher in their culture um, and with the respondents on a long-term basis. Um, it allows the research um, study to go further into investigation of certain phenomena of interest that couldn't be adequately explored with short-term study designs. Um, the researcher may aim to become a part of the culture or the community, and on a smaller scale, staying long enough to go beyond what respondents just tell researchers in an initial interview, for example. And the claims that are made around this is that it leads to better and richer data, um, a bigger chance to identify inconsistencies in responses, um, and detecting patterns um, is more rob robust if we do it this way. So another issue um, that we have investigated is the idea of disconfirmatory cases. Um, so disconfirmatory cases is if we see a trend within the qualitative research, um, have we also identified things that um, are opposite or, or seem to be in contradiction to what many respondents have said? So the presence of a disconfirmatory finding can serve two functions. Um, procedurally, it can build up confidence in the primary researchers' analytical processes. Um, so it, it doesn't need to be specifically present and reported because it might not be present in the data, but it's an example of one of many analytical processes. Um, it also is a source of data. It can be particularly valuable in a synthesis as it suggests that a hypothesis or contextual variation um, needs to be further explored um, in future research. There are problems related to disconfirmatory findings as well. Um, it may be an issue of data adequacy, which I mentioned earlier is another component of grade circle. Perhaps we just don't have enough data to find disconfirmatory cases. And then really should a study be um, knocked down a grade for that? That doesn't seem necessarily uh, productive. So the next issue is something uh, that has traditionally been relatively unique to qualitative research, but is starting to take on uh, some meaning within in, um, effectiveness research as well. And it's the researcher role, especially related to, for example, conflicts of interest. Um, and we have often talked about this in terms of reflexivity. Um, and we don't want this to be an issue of reporting. Have the, has the review team just said we have no conflicts of interest? Um, but rather, have they explored uh, the, has the researcher explored their relationship to the research or the participants and how their role may have interpreted how they collected data, identified participants, analyzed data, or presented findings? And this could have an impact on um, which findings were, uh, for example, reported in a, in a study. Also, we have issues related to participant selection. Um, and whether this is an appropriate criteria for um, assessing critical uh, methodological limitations. 
um, we need to, for example, uh, explore whether uh, explicitly stating the reason for a choice of participant selection method um, has consequences for the primary study and what those are, and whether that influences our ultimate uh, confidence in a review finding. So the Camelot study is a work in progress. We don't have a critical appraisal tool yet, uh, and hopefully it's not so far off as a beta version, but we are working on it. Our, so our next steps are to establish a final list of key criteria. Uh, this will be done then based on any theoretical, experiential, or um, empirical evidence that we find for each criteria. Um, and then uh, determining whether or not one of the existing tools that we identified from that systematic review earlier adequately covers all of these important criteria. Uh, and if they don't, uh, we will then need to develop a critical appraisal tool to be used within grade circle. So I would just like to thank the members of the grade circle methodological limitations subgroup, Sarah, Andrew, Karen, Isolda, and Jane. Uh, and if any of you are interested in contributing or learning more, please uh, send us an email and uh, we're always happy to have more people. So I think we have about 10 minutes left uh, for any questions. I know that that was a lot of information in a short time, uh, but I hope uh, there was something there. And as I said, any question is fine. Thanks so much. That was very interesting. So everyone, please. Uh, either add your question to the chat or you can unmute and pose your question yourself. I must say this sounds like a very um, interesting but complicated process. <laughs> I think that's a nice way to put it, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we've tried to be very systematic in our approach, as we are with everything, uh, but it yeah. means that it's a very long process as well. We we don't want to create another tool um, that's just an adaptation of something else, but we'd rather make sure like and examine what is important. When you're looking at qualitative research, what is important to critical appraisal? Yeah. So there's a question from Sara. Is the thinking that the tool developed, adapted, will be able to be used by everyone from novice to experienced qualitative researchers? Yes, um, I think that's a really great question and we've had a lot of discussion on that. Um, I'm not speaking on behalf of the group right now, this is my personal opinion. I think it should be especially useful for uh, novice uh, researchers. Um, I think that people who are more experienced with qualitative research have perhaps some of these ideas um, and issues ingrained in the way that they work. Um, and that's not to say they're always the correct ones and there are some maybe bad habits we need to correct. Um, but I, I hope that it's especially useful for people who have less experience conducting qualitative synthesis. That makes sense, yeah. Thanks, Sarah, for the question. Thank you. Any, anyone else? I do have a question. Hi, Heather, this is Shamila from Brazil. I'm not Hi, sure whether, how are you? Um, we've been uh, collaborating with Simon and um, Claire and uh, Megan here mm -hmm. in Brazil for a while. Mm -hmm. And because I was responsible for developing the social, well, improving social participation and the inclusion of qualitative research into the health technology assessment for the Ministry of Health here in Brazil, um, there is something that you mentioned that is very dear to what we've been trying to do, which is um, accounting for publications that deploy citizen participation in research design or all the stages of um, research development. And this is something that you mentioned that it doesn't come out in the uh, the Camelot or the Great Circle or CASP or any of those uh, types of um, approaches to evaluate uh, confidence in research findings. Um, I've been collaborating with Jack Nunn. I think he's now working with Cochrane. He developed mm -hmm. this uh, approach called Stardate. Mm -hmm. uh, are you aware of it? Because oh, just slightly. Yeah, it is interesting. It does 
uh, remind me of the uh, item list that Barbara Prensak, who does research in citizen science, developed in 2012, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that people from uh, Health Technology Assessment International ask me all the time <laughs> because um, people are a bit skeptical about qualitative evidence synthesis or qualitative systematic literature reviews. So I'm always being asked about methods and how to do it. Um, so are you thinking about uh, including this type of methodological limitation or how to evaluate it within the working group? Um, so I think that what you're talking about is really important. And I think that um, it's relatively novel for lots of groups of researchers. I understand probably that you and your colleagues have been thinking about it for a long time, but I don't think everybody has. Um, and especially not from a methodological limitations perspective. Um, so on a very personal level, I recently defended my PhD and one of my, um, one of my lectures was about uh, conflicts of interest and patient participation in research. And so I really delved deeply into this topic and that's kind of what has made me more aware of um, the potential biases and advantages that involving end users, patients, whatever word you want to use, uh, in research and the, the connection of that to methodological limitations and how we should be aware of it. Um, so I don't have any answers right now. It has come to, I would say, it's come to the top of my list of things I'd like to investigate and how it influences, um, trustworthiness and our confidence in findings. And I think from the little that I know, um, I think that it can really be addressed in two main ways, but it's an either or situation because we don't want to have it double counted. Um, so we could either have a, a criteria related to participant research because um, it does have a lot of advantages. Um, but there's another way as well, and that's kind of incorporating it within the idea of the role of the researcher. So if the patient or the end user is a researcher, then being aware of their role and the way that influences the design and conduct of the research study. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of interesting things uh, around this, and I don't think that there's a lot that has been done on it previously. So, um, but please correct me if you're wrong, if I'm wrong. And I would, I mean, if you're interested in this area, please send us an email and uh, it'd be really interesting to have your input on this. Um, and if you know of any other research, please send it my way because um, I think it's really interesting and it needs to be addressed as patients are more and more, as it becomes the norm that patients and end users are involved in research. Thank you. And thanks, Charmila, for your question. Um, any other questions from anyone? I don't see any other hands up or messages. If you're too shy, um, please feel free to email me afterwards. <laughs> uh, I'm happy yes, to take that's great. One. That's great. Um, did you share your email in the presentation or? Uh, I think so. Let me just check. You want to put it in the chat, perhaps? I can put it in the chat. Um, OK, great. Thank you. That, that would be great. Um, Last chance for a question. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. So um, thanks again for presenting today. This was really interesting, um, a really challenging area of work, but really necessary. And I think it's gonna be really important. Um, I'm, I'm dipping my feet into qualitative evidence synthesis, so I look forward to <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> thinking about these issues. <laughs> Uh, it'll be good that by then uh, you have we have a tool that we can use. <laughs> um, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Uh, so thank you so much, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And I uh, want to ask everyone to please evaluate this webinar. It really informs how we run the webinars, and and I've paste I put the link in the chat box for everyone to please complete it.
So thanks again, everyone, for joining and see you next time. Thank you, Heather, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.